everything. So when you're talking to a lot of these people, uh, these places, countries, you know, so when you say high grade or say they hear the word father, if you say father and they tell you they say padre, then they're thinking about the big cathedral up there. They're not really thinking about our heavenly father. So it's very crucial that, you know, they understand so you, you don't lose a lot of things in language. And then there's the culture. Uh, and I know that I don't know every one of you sisters and brothers and wives here yet on a first name basis. I bet most of you. But not one of you came up with nothing to kiss me this morning. But neither did any of you brothers. I've never been to a worship service in Mexico where the ladies didn't kiss you on one cheek and the men hooked you kissed you on the other cheek. See, that's their custom. That's their culture. Now, I, I got some ladies and Looked up kind of acting like I'm talking to you crazy. But I don't understand that. You know, so it's a, it's a shocker. So some things you just don't do here, they would be offended if you didn't do there. And here, we think now today, a handshake used to be a real firm handshake and a hug from the side. But now, since couple, what's the biggest thing to do? Nod your head, good morning. Elbow bump at the best. Fist bump if you just real lucky. So they've taken the intimacy out of the, the church family. And so I hate that that's happened. I really don't appreciate it, but that's what's happened. Does that mean that we love each other less? No. Is that hard for us to express it? Yes. Is it different here than it is in, in Mexico? No, same kind of thing. They're 50 times as well. And then country. We have too many things here. Uh, I even asked this before even coming on board with Global Missions that often uh, in school, when I was in, in class, we had several people, that men that were there uh, getting a degree in Bible from other countries. And not all of them wanted to go back. Not all of them was, had the intention of going back after being here a little while. They came here with the intention to get an education to go back home. That didn't the way it turned out for some of them. And I applaud those brothers that came here, got an education, brought their families here, made the sacrifices, and then when the time was up, they got their degrees, they went back to their countries. I never will forget one of my dear brothers I love tremendously, who is in Africa, uh, Brother Philip Peary. Uh, super great guy, and I pray that I run into him one day in this mission world. He came here, got his education, brought us. Brought his wife, had two babies while he was here. But instead of making them stay here, he loaded them up and they went back to Africa. All schools established by 21st Global Missions offer one degree, and that's Bible. And I'm so greatly appreciative of that. Uh, we don't have to worry about uh, being diverse and, and getting distracted. Uh, so, so often we get into college and our kids come back, they go to college for five years, come back with six degrees. We don't know what they are when they get there. We don't know what they are while they're there. We don't know what they are when they get home. And we see that, not every child, but we see the confusion. But in Bible, we have two English classes, two computer classes, one economics class. And one of those uh, computer classes ended up being uh, uh, an agriculture class because, you know, if you're out in the, out in the bush and... What if you have a house that has no electricity? Brother, where are you going to plug in that computer? Where are you going to plug, where are you going to plug in them laptops? No need of them. So what is something that is great? Something that's impressed me, and I looked at those slides, and I looked at the Global Missions website, and I read all the stuff that's there with the material that was there back some time ago. And it was right after Danny uh, Cash came on board. And, of course, Danny Cash has been one of the board members, but uh, Brother Danny was... Uh, he was doing a, putting his slide show together, and I noticed Brother Mark Barber, and I got to meet Brother Mark Barber this past fall, and he is a veterinarian over here from Jasper, Alabama, and he went down and he taught them how to grow corn. And so now if you go to Nigeria, down off the port city of Buchanan, in Grand Bossa County, there's a church there called the Corn Farm Church. Wonder why. And was taught how to raise corn. And that congregation, I have to say, is now the, the plan is working with global missions. We're teaching and encouraging and, and growing and recruiting. On and on and on it goes, repeating the cycle. So you have a church there that's relatively young, 
but because the students are graduates from global missions, some are elders and some are deacons. One's the preacher. How great is that? They came into Gorbal League, got their education, Brother Maxwell Ray, and then went back and started another congregation there, and now they're up and going. How old are some of the congregations that the Apostle Paul had got up, got going, got established before you know what happens? He tells Timothy and Titus about appointing elders and deacons in those places. See, those men were religious men. They crossed over out of Judaism. Now they are now Christians. Some of them are Gentiles. But they got an education quick. So when they saw that they were meeting that standard, the criteria, they were appointed as elders. Takes a special kind of person, doesn't it? Global Mission does not use any collective funds to compensate a student for attending classes. And that's what I love most. I've been in church planning. Takes a lot of money to, to church plan. A lot of money invested in a preacher. And it's sad to say, some of those preachers will let you down in those other countries. Because they're dependent upon the American dollar. They're not as frugal sometimes. They're human. They mess up too. But what I notice about this, when you're educating these students and you don't pay them to come to class, you see the level of sincerity and devotion and commitment. So when you're not paying someone, that makes a great deal. If we were paying someone to come to class, you say here, Fulton's got a lot of money in it. You can, I'm, I'm talking about the church here. I'm talking about Fulton, the city of Fulton. Lots of industry. Lots of money. Lots of jobs. Money to be had. You go to some of these places where there are no jobs. You got a place that comes in there and they can come in and they can fill the room and know that if they come there, all they got to do is come every Saturday and they get $15 to $20. Well, if you ain't seen the $15 to $20 in the last six months, how enticing would that be? So I want you to see and understand the importance of not paying preachers. What they have to get out here and work and earn and see the level of devotion to that, to that class and ultimately to the Lord. We have two schools in the Ukraine which have classes have been uh, you know, postponed indefinitely right now until we can get uh, Odessa and that cross. They're under attack from Russia. We have one in Belarus, two in Mexico, one in Guatemala, three in Sierra Leone. Uh, three in Liberia. Uh, the newest school is there in, is in uh, Lofa County, Liberia. Two in Peru, one in Cameroon, two in Nicaragua, one in Costa Rica, two in Nigeria, one in Guyana, and one in uh, Ohana, uh, Honduras. And here's Nigeria. That's Old Boodoo there. And also, Akad Usin is here. And there's the graduation class, March of 24th. There were 10 graduates. Notice those two ladies up front. How many ladies are teaching Bible class this morning? I didn't see who all came in and went because the classrooms are back that way. But when I was growing up as a child, up until about the age of 12, all the boys were taught by women. And then when we got to about the age of 12, we were taught only by the men in the congregation where I grew up. But see the age difference in those men? And so you have a commitment level of people from all ages and all walks of life wanting an education in the Bible. They might grow the church and grow the kingdom. And there they are again. And I did not know for the longest that that man in the back right there is Cliff Jarrett. Who was there? Most of you know where the Cliff. But, uh, he, I asked him, they were visiting, and I asked him the other day, I said, uh, I said, how many do y'all have in the home there uh, where you're at in Nigeria? And he says, too plenty. I said, how many is that? And his wife says, about 52. So they, they have a big work. They were trying to help those who need help. But he was there to uh, participate in the graduation. They had 10 graduates there, 13 congregations, 55 baptisms, and 19 restoration prayer requests. Those numbers doesn't look so fit, you know, too, too significant. But I read the reports, and we get a report from the schools when they do graduating, and there's five questions that are asked. And the first question is, are you presently working with a congregation or congregations? Are there some of those places, some of those young men, 
We'll be working with more than one congregation because they like the church in a house or in a home, so they're kind of remote, so they're having a, you know, there'll be more than one congregation they're working with. Then the second question is, how many congregations have been established while you have been in classes that you have been instrumental in, that you have taken part in, that you've been a major port, a player in, and then there's baptisms right there. It says, how many baptisms have you been instrumental in, played a major part in, in the last 12 months? So those 55 baptisms and those 10 graduates was not for the entire time they've been in class, but in the last 12 months alone. And the prayer request and uh, restoration is the same. In August 28, 2021, we had seven of graduating in Georgetown, Guyana. And when I say that uh, we overlap, the Wynn Church of Christ, so Wynn, Arkansas, is where my baby daughter and her husband and babies are members at, and attend worship in. Brother Tim Davis is the one of the missions men that is there. He and Brother Fred Strasser have been known for years. And they support Lynn and I in this endeavor. But I found out when I was talking to them that uh, Brother Tim comes in, and they have visited with this very congregation right here, but they go to a whole other region from where Global Missions is at. They run into one of our graduates there uh, out in the bush, but they go in a whole other region. You know, that country is big, wide open, <laughs> and very remote, very quick. And so when we say we run into each other, uh, yes, we do. That's the North Road Church. There's the graduates that are there. See those ladies graduating? And seven to graduate, zero congregation established, two baptisms, and 22 restorations and prayers. Uh, you'll see a variation in numbers. Part of that's going to be due to COVID in the last 12 months. Uh, some places are going to be a little more receptive and a little less you know, able to get to and to work with. Here's Gorbali and Monrovia, Liberia. And now there's a third school there in Liberia. Up and Jesse just got back. They uh, started classes March of 12, I believe it was. The first Saturday in, uh, first Saturday school they had was March of 12. Brother Jay uh, Venetius Fala is the director there. And I think they started out with about uh, 29 new students when they got started. And that's Brother Maxwell Way, uh, director Gorbali, and guest speaker. At the graduation in Monrovia, had about 12 to graduate December 19th. That's the Smythe Road Church. And there's the graduates. There's one receiving a diploma. I like some of the outfits. They're a little bit different than what we are. The common white shirt, those prints. And there's 12 graduates, had 13 congregations established, 103 baptisms. See the difference in the numbers? So you, some places are more receptive than others. Those men get out there and work and uh, do a great job and uh, trying to spread the gospel. And uh, one of the things that when I was at Magnolia uh, that I had to do was I had to do a service report every week. As I was training as a deacon at Ashland, I started classes, but a part of the Bible school was, it, as a student, since you're taking a, you get a degree in Bible, this is one of the requirements. You had to fill out how many prayer requests you was, had been involved in or how many people you prayed for, prayed with, how many Bible studies, how many visits you had made, how many worship services had you been in and been involved in or area gospel meetings. Everything that you had been involved in with ministry, you had to keep a tab of that, okay? And so when we're keeping tab of that, it helps them to get an idea of what's going on. Well. Some of those young men would come in there with almost zero in numbers of things that there, while others would have a huge number of things that they were involved in, and then while others kind of in the, in the middle range. So things vary. Those numbers vary depending on the area. But look at those numbers of baptisms in the last 12 months. And there's uh, Brother Adam Sayway, former graduate and guest speaker there at Gorbali. In January, and because of COVID, this graduation was delayed. But we had eight to graduate there. And that's part of the graduates. There are again. Had eight graduates, 32 congregations established, 824 baptisms. Phenomenal. See, so when I started out in January of this year, January, February, March, and April, uh, that number of total graduate, I mean, total baptisms for the year, for the year was only about 260 
7. And Jay and I and, and, and uh, Steve were sitting in the office and we were talking about it and a couple of board members uh, just, you know, that's the COVID must have had a huge impact upon on it. And, you know, this had to send a number of this law since 2016. Because we're looking at all the records and all the numbers, keeping track of everything, tracking what's going on. And so we're looking at those numbers and then all of a sudden, in the next few days, we get in this report from Borbley. From Maxwell. And I was stunned. As I looked at those reports and I was looking at those young men that was there, and several of those young men, three or four of them, five maybe, had baptized around 100 to 120 persons each. So where they were working was a field white unto harvest. So they had just had, their graduation was a little bit late, January the 23rd, but it's actually 2021 when all of that had happened had taken place in 2021, but they couldn't get to graduation until uh, January because of COVID. But look at that number there. Here it is. Uh, our Peru have two schools there, one in Lima and one in Trujillo, uh, Peru. Had four and ten graduates. There's Brother Rodolfo Casas, elder at the church, a teacher at the school. Uh, he speaks for the graduation there in Lima. And there's the graduates. And that's Brother Thomas Barrio, uh, director. And there's the graduates there with Brother Rudolph Casas, uh, as a teacher. And isn't that wonderful that we can have the elders involved in an area of congregation that is already established, and we can work out of that congregation and to go out of the other most parts of the, of the world and recruit uh, students to come in, and then the elder be one of the teachers. Uh, when I was uh, growing up, the elders. All the men teachers were elders. You know, my entire life, you know, that was uh, that was that was part of what they did. And my father was was one of the uh, one of the teachers uh, as I was serving there under under him as a deacon. And uh, and upon his death, I got his his books and his study notes. And I'm like, oh, my old dad wasn't near as dumb as I thought he was. He's a pretty smart fellow. He studied, learned the truth. So my dad was born and raised homeless. And so he began to study the Word of God and with my mother, and he wanted to prove my mother wrong. And the more he studied the Word of God, the more he came to find out that there was a different church in the Bible that he'd been attending. And so he ended up becoming an elder in the Lord's church. And so I'm so thankful that, that he studied himself without a degree, and he wanted me to get a degree in Bible and come back and work at Ashman. I want you to look at the, the floor and the chairs. I'm more impressed and the church is there, the simplicity. And every time I've been to Mexico, we've been out of the country, Linda and I, about eight times, and it's always, those people are just proud to be a part of the gospel. It doesn't have to have padded pews for them. It doesn't have to have brand new carpet for these big brethren. They're just, they just want to hear the gospel. And there's Brother Bill Merleon, uh, the teacher of the school there, uh, leads the graduation ceremony. There's the graduating class, Brother Percy Andres, the teacher, the graduates, Brother Thomas Parrillo, and Bill Murray Leon, all there together. I had four to graduate in, in Lima, ten in Trujillo, uh, zero baptisms in Lima, eleven in Trujillo, uh, twenty-four restorations there in Lima, and sixteen in the other. And here's Ohana. Uh, this is uh, I'm fixing to be next Lord's Day, Lord willing, I'll be in McKenzie, Tennessee. Lynn and I, and we'll be visiting and reporting back to the congregation there that played a major part uh, in that school and getting it set up and getting it going uh, with Brother Danny Cash. And here they only have uh, two graduates, but still, see the simplicity, but still, they make a big deal out of it. So for someone to get a degree in Bible is a big, big deal. And I do not know the man's name or a white shirt and blue, blue tie on but in one of the congregations they spoke up, and I believe it was at, uh, they didn't tell me if I'm right, was it Skullbone Road? Yeah, it was, at Skullbone Road. Brother Jack Walker spoke up, one of the elders there, and he says, I know who that man is, but I can't remember his name. I said, you got one up on me, brother. I, can, I don't even know the man. I said, so at least you've made it. But they were there and part of that church and, and helping to get that going, Brother uh, Gaming, and one of the graduates speaking there at the graduation. And there's the graduates and the teachers and students in Honduras. Uh, and the results that came in, uh, 
but I just had an upgrade of my, my PowerPoint. Uh, there was about three congregations and about six baptisms and about 19 uh, prayer requests and that, uh, restorations there. Here's Nicaragua, uh, and that's Brother Joel Bustamante, and then Diary Nicaragua. He came here, got his education in Searcy, Arkansas, went back to his country, and you have those graduates there, and I think it's nine, boy, nine, nine men and, and, and five young ladies. And here he is in Sudat Sedino, and I think it's ten young men and four young ladies in that graduating class. Not all were able to attend the graduation due to COVID. But there's 14 graduates there in Diary. The 29 congregations established, 46 baptisms, 58 restorations. And then Sudat Sedino, 13 graduates. 18 congregations, 48 baptisms, and 42. Uh, I'm going to go quickly on. There's Brother Leoncio Trujillo uh, there in uh, uh, San Ramon, Costa Rica, with one graduate there. Two baptisms, two restorations. I want to go. Here's where I wanted to go, because I don't know how much time we got. Someone call time on me, sister. What time is it? How much time do we have? Two minutes? Two to three minutes? Okay, well, good. You know what that does, Brother Joe? That leaves no room for questions. <laughs> 645 graduates since 2015. Classes started back in 2000. But 2015 is when Jay had, they had started really keeping records, trying to track everything. And since that time, we had 645 graduates. 917 congregations established, 6,063 baptisms, 3,651 restorations have been calculated and kept record of. Now, I don't know, do you look at that 6,000 baptisms? I don't know the, the numbers of, if you combine them all. If we knew exactly how many baptisms from the whole time they've been in class. See, those are only the 12 months of those graduates, the last 12 months that they were there. So I don't know what the, the real number is, but I'm sure it's going to be much more than 6,063. But what a track record. What a track record. I mean, you you start talking about this, and you talk about the amount of money. Mrs. Phyllis Bush, love her and appreciate her so much, she... Uh, she keeps track of every every dime that comes in the building down there, and she makes sure that the because it's a you know nonprofit organization, she makes sure that the board members if they got a question about anything money wise, if any churches got any question about anything money wise, anything she can let them know exactly to the penny where everything goes and what's being done with everything. I will tell you this: the cost of giving education in these other countries is phenomenally cheap compared to here. I mean, really inexpensive. And so money that's invested in global missions is money very well spent. Brethren, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's phenomenal how much education we can get out for the amount of money that we end up having to, to invest into. Thank you so much.
Good morning to everyone. We're very glad that uh, all of you could come today, especially uh, for our visitors. Uh, we have Miss Betty Crichton here from uh, Levine, Tennessee, and she attends the uh, Sand Hill uh, Church of Christ. She'll be returning uh, to Tennessee this afternoon, and we pray for her safe return. And we're very glad that uh, uh, any... That, that we have a large number of people who are visiting with us, and uh, we have also a regular congregation to visit uh, who are yeah. attending. Matthew uh, is a, preaching at the Seligent uh, Homecoming today, and Don Robertson from 21st Global Missions is uh, preaching uh, in his uh, position today. We offer our sympathies to the family of Randy Holly is recovering from surgery. Irina Osborne is dealing with uh, her cancer diagnosis. Jim Clark is recovering from heart surgery. Margaret Wade is recovering from heart surgery. And Margaret's here with us today. We're very glad that she is. Sophie Grubbs is, is dealing with health difficulties, and Sophie, Sophie is with us today. Arlene Gray is having difficulties. Uh, Ricky Howell, Hallie... Hattie Miller's son is having health difficulties. Linda Butler, Rodney, Rodney Kent's grandmother, is undergoing therapy. Uh, Dixie Murphy has, is dealing with uh, treating cancer. Doyce Delaney has cancer. In our services this morning, Jim Chandler will lead our singing. Uh, Rodney Kent will read our scripture. Mackie Wade will word our opening prayer. Don Robertson will deliver the message. Uh, Richard Comer will preside over the Lord's Supper. And Andy Coker will provide for our... Sing number 250. 250, how sweet, how heavenly. And we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word. When each can fill his brother's sigh and with him bear a part. When sorrow flows from eye to eye and joy from heart to heart. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above, and he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. And now before scripture reading and prayer number 261. 261, I am thine, O Lord. And we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 
I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious. Scripture reading this morning will come from Psalms chapter 25, verses 20 through 22. Psalms 25, verses 20 through 22. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of their troubles. Let us pray together. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us that we can come together and worship you. Father, we ask you to be with us that we might remove all the things from our mind except worship and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you so much for your love and mercy. We thank you for your son that died on the cross, that we through him can have eternal life. Father, we ask you to be with those that are mentioned here today in our announcements ask you to be with them and help them and their needs at this time and may they look to you for their comfort Father we ask you to be with those traveling ask you to help them to have safe travel we ask you to be with the Mayola Wilson family Comfort and strengthen them and be with them as only you can. Father, we thank you for this congregation that meets here and each member that we have the opportunity to worship here and to work together and 
we ask your blessings on us as we go forward in the days ahead that we can live faithful lives in service to you. Father, we ask you to be with Brother Don as he comes and speaks to us today and help him that he can say the things that will encourage us and help us to take those things and live better lives in service to you. Father, we ask you to be with our country. We ask you to be with those that lead. We ask you to be with countries throughout the world and especially with those countries that are fighting and help the innocent people to be safe and help those that are torn apart uh, by the war and help those families and bless them and may they look to you for their comfort. Father, we are so thankful that we live in a country that we can come together and to worship you. We ask you to be with us today and be with those worshiping throughout the world and be with those that preach and teach your word. We ask you to be with us as we know we often come short of those things that you would have us do. We ask you to be with us and forgive us when we fail you. We ask you to be with us today and Every day that we live is our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our invitation song this morning will be number 337. 337, Is Thy Heart Right with God? And we'll sing all three verses. And now before lesson number 231, 231, Hilltops of Glory. We'll sing all three verses. Shall we stand as we sing? <clears throat> Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land Way down in Egypt mid burning sand Moses had started for Canaan's land Never turn backward, always ascend Unto the journey's end Hilltops of glory. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Footsteps of Jesus before us lead. We tread life's journey, his warning seed. Evil allurements cannot prevail. I'm on the upward trail, hilltops of glory. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. 
Well, good morning. I want you to know that God loves you and I love you. And I'm honored uh, to be here with you this morning. I, uh, I normally would put on a mic and, and maneuver around and that kind of stuff, but I'm going to stay with the podium today and uh, try to make sure that everybody can hear me. <clears throat> be turning your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm 25. When we talk about putting our trust in the Lord, when did that begin? And who's a good example of that? And what does it mean to put my trust in the Lord? These are some of the questions as Christians would say, well, that's no brainer. I've been doing this as long as I can remember. But when I think about trusting the Lord, putting my trust in Him, I remember some time ago, back in my younger years, how I found it hard to trust in the Lord and still be human. Does anybody recognize that fact? You still have to be human? Well, what do we do in times like that? And how do we adjust? And how do we get better? How do, how do we make our lives better? There has to be a, a balance. My father was not of the religious faith for a long time. He had... Uh, fell away from the Lord and hadn't been faithful. And a part of his frustration was he was going from extreme emotionalism uh, to more of the body of Christ and Christians trying to love the Lord and keep His commandments. And so often he could see two ends of the extreme. It's almost no emotion to a lot of emotion. And I was like, as he and I would discuss things back and forth finally, as I grew up and began to mature and got into to, to, to being a deacon and serving as a deacon, we discussed the Bible more, and we discussed principles and concepts more on how to get a good understanding, get our feet on solid ground when it comes to Christianity. Well, I want us to think about this morning the 25th Psalm. I want you to think about the life that David lived. And most of us know many assets, I mean, facets of, of, of David's life. We, we know that he would sin. He did sin and he did some great things uh, at the same time. But how do we reconcile this in our minds? How do we justify this in our minds? How could a man like David, with blood on his hands and not being able to, to uh, build the temple, uh, the proper worship place for, for God's children, how can he be kept back from that? How could he write such wonderful, beautiful words and how could he be known as a man after God's own heart and still we see the sin that was in his life from time to time? We have little windows and little, little pieces of information that has been shared with us. But I want you to think about it as you look at your life and as you go through your daily routine, your daily walk with, in life, you get out of bed and what's your routine? I have my coffee, breakfast, Another cup of coffee, watch some news, work in the garden, work in the yard. Or you may be like I was at one time, you get out of bed and your feet's on the floor and you're running because you got to get to work. And you got to get a cup of coffee on the way if you drink coffee, otherwise we're just drinking Mountain Dew. So all of us have different lives. We all start our lives every day in a different way. None of us are exactly the same, but here's the one consistency among all of us, brethren. We're all human. We all still love and trust and serve the same God, and we all still have to deal with the same person, self. So how do we do that? Thank you for the song there, that joy that I may not understand now, but in the future to come, brother, there's going to be a level of joy that we can understand and enjoy because it will not worry about any longer any sadness or sickness or any of those types of things. Those things will be done away with in heaven. But what about maintaining joy and peace while here upon this earth? How do we do that? How do we get out of pure form or extreme excitement? And how do we gain enthusiasm? How do we allow enthusiasm to become our fire and let excitement become the glow. So if we're not too careful, what we'll do is we'll, we'll say, well, I, I, I have enthusiasm, I have motivation, I have drive, but I want evidence because I don't want anybody to think that I'm too emotional 
sensationalism. Well, I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I've been where you are just very ritualistic, very traditional, very regimented. And I also have been in some places that were more of the charismatic. Jumping and running around and screaming and hollering because, you know, there was a time in my life I was like, well, I don't feel God's presence. I want what they got. So don't condemn me and cast me to the curb before you listen to everything this morning. So as I found myself over here trying to get what they got, I wanted all of that excitement, the enthusiasm. And what I could find after about two months, brethren, was this. That yes, they were having that, but it was a routine. See, they had fallen victim to the same thing that the Galatian church had done. So they were trying, these, these people are trying to inc incorporate what God has said do to have enthusiasm. Yet they're going to keep some of the law, but not all of the law. Then they want to be like over in Rome, when Paul is Romans chapter 6, he's saying you're trying to abuse grace. You're trying to say we can live any life we want to live and we can do whatever we want simply because if we sin the more, then grace will abound. So it doesn't matter what we do. And then James comes along and he says, why hadn't y'all put it together? Why haven't you figured out that there has to be grace to, mess, to cover your sins when you mess up? Then you have to have your works working together. We're to do what God has asked us to do out of simple obedience. Do what, the, what, what is the law? Well, we're not trying to keep the Ten Commandments. When we're talking about the law, what is the greatest law? The love of the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and the strength, and the second is like unto it to love yourself. Love your neighbor as thyself. How many of us really live that life every day? Who do we put our trust in? See, the world wants to put their trust in law keeping, and they want to put their trust in self. And so how do we find balance in all of that? That's what I want us to do today is I want us to look at the 25th Psalm with this in mind. To whom did David trust? In whom did David put all of his trust? You'll never find once where David trusted in himself. And I hope that as we go through the 25th Psalm this morning, you're going to see three aspects about David that maybe hadn't just jumped off the page at you before. See, David was one that was enthusiastic. He could be excited, but he knew which was which. Now, I'm going to go back for just a moment. And I want to bring you up. See, when I was over here looking to see what these people had in all this excitement, I noticed that on any given Sunday from the back pew of the building back there, because that's where I was at, I was just a, I wasn't even a participator. I was just an attender. I wanted to see this. All the things that my father had talked about as a child growing up, I wanted to see this for myself. So I'm back there and I'm watching and it was almost like clockwork. They, they have the, the piano and the organ and the, and the drums and the guitars up here on the, on the stage. And the stage is always bigger, so they've got plenty of room. And then the preacher gets up and he begins to talk and he begins this exciting and thrilling message about the love of God, of wealth and health. And then you'll have some to get over here, they'll get the spirit. And then one over here will get the spirit. And then one or two or three down there will get the spirit. So they get this emotion is what they're doing. And then what you know, the next thing you know is they'll be up here. And they'll be in the altar. And then some of them will be talking in tongues, speaking in tongues. That's what they said. And see, the first time I saw that, I thought, wow. Brethren, I was on the back pew saying, if that's real, I want some of that. I was skeptic to say the least. I said, if that's real, I want some of that. But after about six Sundays of that, here's what I noticed. Same from start to finish. Same people, same ritual, same music, maybe a different song, same thing, again and again and again. So what I'm telling you that to say this, I've experienced empty 
religion, worship. I've experienced empty, loud, emotional worship. So how do we reconcile this? And of this world of chaos that we live in, and we're trying to get people to see the love of God, what is it that others held on to and still hold on to? Can they have the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit? Absolutely. It's what the Bible promises. But how is that possible? Let's look this morning. And let's look at the psalmist as he says, you know, there's a, a, a lot to say about David. We know that he has confidence in God. We know that he's, he's enamored with all the things that's going on around him. He says, I am never in need, if you read the 23rd Psalm. He says, basically, he mentions green pastures. He says, you know, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Thy rod and thy comfort, they, you know, your staff, they comfort me. So David, he says, I can see the tranquility that is in God. I can see the promises that he's made, and I can see him keeping his word. So how does that become evident in my life? His faith in God enabled him to overcome obstacles that would probably derail most of us for life. Remember, he faced a lion, a bear, a giant. And worst of all, he faced himself. But in the middle of that, he also had to face a mentally unstable king, King Saul. And then he ended up having open rebellion in his own family, his own son. So when faced with these setbacks and difficulties, our reactions reveal if we're people of optimism or pessimistic. Remember these four things. Super great graduation speech by brother, I'm not going to say brother, by Matthew McConaughey. They give it a, a graduating class. And I picked up on about four of those things, and I've worked on them. And I said, you know, he said something, and he said a mouthful to the graduating class, something that really the church needs to hear. Number one, life is not easy. And don't forget it. Number two, nothing we do is unbelievable, and it never is. And number three, don't live in regret. Create moments with great outcomes. And one of the things that I have to add to that, and I want, I want people to understand as a, as a Christian, as much as lieth in you, be at peace with all men. Rather, the church would be in such greater places today, Christianity would be in such greater astronomical in number, if we would just learn to live at peace with all men, especially the household of faith. We try to get along in the workplace. We try to get along in our homes. Why can't we get along when we worship? See, we need to work on this one concept as a Christian. There's one thing if you'll observe David and Abraham and others, they learned the art of dying to self slowly and painfully. And unless we learn to do the very same thing and recreate what David and, and Abraham and others have done, I need to learn to put more of God and less of me. Wonderful song that is in our hymn. When we started out at first, all of self and none of thee, then at last I learned it's all of thee and none of self. And that's what it means to be a real Christian. But finding balance and how do you get from here and, you, and get from over here and you get in the middle of God's Word where it's filled with grace and truth? How do we do that? I'll understand this. When we have joy, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In Romans chapter 5 verse 2. We put our trust in Him and our happiness then may change, but our joy is constant. You can't chase happiness. Joy is always in process. It is a constant in the doing. Never forget it. Joy is independent of outward circumstances. Our situation may change. Our circumstances may change. But our joy is constant. Hope is based on our desire with great expectation. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verse 24, he says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what is man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Obviously, yes. 
pay close attention. When we talk about having the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, and peace. If you notice, there's about nine of those characteristics that are there, but it's only produced as a single. When you talk about the fruit of the Spirit, it doesn't say fruits. And often we refer to them as graces or virtues. But it's fruit of the Spirit. I want you to think of that in this manner. Love. That's agape in love. That is the, the better for others. That's the love that Christ had for us. That joy is the constant, it's a constant delight. That peace is that, that peace of tranquility that I'm just, everything is calm in my life. When I think about the, the bird, it, it builds its nest. And when he has that nest and he's out over limb, just imagine in your mind, you want to talk about perfect peace? Just imagine now that that bird has built that nest on that limb. It's right on the huge drop off of the Niagara Falls. And all of the rustling and rumbling and roaring sounds of all of that water. Yet that bird is in its nest completely unbothered. She's nursing her babies. And she's not worried about what's going on in the world around her. And that's perfect peace. And that's the life that we ought to be seeking. But is it possible is it doable? Can it happen? When we think about that peace and that love and that joy, I want you to think about love, joy, and peace as being from the heart of man, the seat of our emotions. The thinking, loving, and trusting part of man. The emotional part of person. And all of those other self-control, patience, and gentleness, and kindness, and all of those that are mentioned there, guess what those are? All of those are outworkings of our faith. All of those are just demonstrations of our faith that James talks about in James chapter 2. You want to know about my faith? Let me show you. You want to know about my works? Listen to what I tell you. In other words, you cannot have works without faith and you cannot have faith without works. You can't separate the two. And that's what, what James is writing about when Paul is talking about grace and our abuse of that and taking the law and mixing it with the with the, the with Christianity and, and abusing that, when he calls them you old foolish Galatians that you are, you can't you can't merit your way to heaven. You can't blend Christianity and the law together. It won't work. Who was he saying trust in? James, Paul, in both Romans and Galatians, give tribute back and quote to the Old Testament. Genesis fifteen verse six. Even before the sign of the covenant of the circumcision that God had made with Abraham and his children and his descendants, he says, in chapter 12, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. In chapter 15, he says, then it was accounted unto him righteousness because he believed and trusted God. And then he gives a sign for the covenant in verse 6 of chapter 17. So who was Abraham trusting? God, his promises. Who was Paul trusting? God, His promises. Well, let's look at David. You have Abraham 430 years before the law is given. Then you have David 400 years after the law is given. And God's servants are not putting any faith and trust in, in, in the keeping of the law. Will they do that? Will they say, yes, we need to be doing those things? Yes, we need to be faithful to God? Absolutely. But who were they trusted in all along? Look, if you will, in verse 1 of the 25th Psalm. David is writing, and it's a, it's a, it's, it, you have to know the Hebrew to get the understanding of who he's talking to and what he's saying. And this just comes from a little bit deeper study. Because I didn't know this for myself for a long time. He says, To you, O Lord, and that name there is Yahweh, self-existing one, eternal one, he says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And the 24th Psalm had declared that God does not want to be worshipped by something, someone who lifts up falsehood that is emptiness and meaningless as vain. No idols. He doesn't want any of those things. Don't blend your idol worship with me. It's just this one. I'm just the one God. Rather, David lifts up his mind, his innermost feelings, and his desires to God. He's basically saying that God has been, is, and will be the center of his life. Now look in verse 2 of Psalm 25. 
He says, oh my God. He starts out with, to you, O Lord. Then he says, oh my God. Now, if you want to stop for just a second and think about that. That word there for God is Elohim. El in the Hebrew is for God. Elohim is the plural of that. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, we think that in the beginning God created. And when it starts out, it talks about the Lord. In chapter 2, about verse 4, he comes back and says, the Lord God. So even Moses understood that there's God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit. They got it. They were putting it together. They were listening. They were in tune with God. So when we have the word Lord, that is the Master Eternal One, Yahweh, and I have now God, so David is trusting in the promises that have been made all the way back to Adam and Eve. Remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? He says that I'm going to separate proto-evangelical. In other words, first type of Christ, the first reference we think of. Big fancy word I didn't know until I got to college. Really not important. But we think about the promise that has been made right there in Genesis 3.15. I'm going to bring death. I'm going to kill Satan's power. Death will no longer reign. But Jesus is going to die in the process. And that's how it ends up in the garden. Of Gethsemane, then on the cross. So who is he trusting in? Here's the significance. He says, oh my God. In you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. When he says that, he's writing, he says, remember now, David in his life, he's already now king. Saul has killed himself because he was treacherous. Ends up falling on his own javelin or sword to take his own life because he lost the battle. But he had been pursuing David all of this time. And at one time, Saul is inside this cave. And David comes up and he's in already in the cave in the other back parts of it. And he slips up and he cuts off the hem of his garment. And when Saul goes back down, he's there with this man. And David comes out and he says, but I could have killed you. You ever thought about why he didn't? See, David had such reverence for God and such respect for the God that he served and had been learning about and knowing about for all of these years. And everything had been handed down to him and he had been taught all of his life. He respected God's anointed. He respected God's anointed. And he says, I know God, what I have learned is this. He says that if we'll live right and do right, then you will bless us. And then if we don't, if we, it seems like it's your children are failing and, and those that are coming against us and tried like the Babylonians, the Syrians, whoever it may be, is they're coming and attacking us and we lose the battles, it's a reflection upon you that we hadn't been serving you. That there's something wrong. In essence, David says, God, if, if, if I'm not victorious, it makes both of us look bad. Now look with me in verse 3. Indeed, none of those who wait on you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. One who waits on God when he comes to God as a faithful follower as of his will, he prays for a blessing, then that follower goes on in great anticipation that God will respond according to his will, to his truth and his grace, to his wisdom. So we ought to be pursuing God's ways Trusting God's ways, leaving some things for God to answer in His time and not ours. But be, be sure, be rest assured that David is right in this prayer and he's, he's trusted in God all of this time and he wants God's will to be pursued in God's way and God to receive all the glory. Look in verse 4. He says, Make known your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths. I'm reminded of 2 Samuel 12. We know that David as a human has messed up with Bathsheba and he's had an illegitimate child and along the way and in the process he's had Uriah killed. So Nathan the prophet comes to him and he says, there was a man who had a lamb and there was another man who had thousands of lambs and this man just was not content with all that he had so he went over and he got this one. David, reckon what we ought to do with him, king. David says, off with his head. And what does Nathan the prophet say? Thou art the man. 
See, wouldn't it be great in our lives if we could ask God to teach us and to remind us of His ways and we could stay straight on it? It would be great and it would be wonderful. Most of you have a newer modern vehicle. Have any of you discovered this little switch on that little button on there? It's called lane control. Show of hands. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You got a vehicle? Well, if you hadn't found it yet, you might find it. But as you're going down the road, if you don't know when you're aware of it and you're going down the interstate and you know you can pass any time, as long as there's not somebody beside you. But brother, when you go to do this and the car goes, you go to do this, and it started trying to pull you back. So Lynn didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. So they called her baby daughter, who we got the car from. And she says it's lane controlled. In other words, it keeps you between the lines. It won't let you get out of track. If it does, you'll feel it jerk. She says, here's how you cut it off. Brother, wouldn't it be great? And wouldn't it be wonderful, Brother Jim, if I could just walk up and touch you on the shoulder, have lane control, and you'd never sin again. Never get out of your lane. Never do anything wrong. It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Well, we have to learn those <clears throat> Excuse me. We have to learn those things from God. David is learning his lane. He's learning how to get back in his lane. Because of Psalm 51, he repents. You know, the thing that stands out most to me there is I want to put these juxtaposition to one another. For David to begin writing at this level, we know he has a sense of presence. He has a sense of presence. But then what happens when he begins to write the 51st Psalm and the 32nd Psalm? He feels an absence of presence. See, he knows that God is not pleased with his actions. And brethren, that's what we need today more than anything, is we need a sense of presence. We need to have a sense of God's presence with us and that what we're doing is right and acceptable to him. Amen? Amen. Is that not what is something that we pray each and every Lord's day when we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ? Lord, let our actions be acceptable to you. Let our worship be praised to you. And nothing less, nothing more. David says, I will acknowledge you in all of my, in, in all of my ways. In verse 6, he says, Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from old. All the way back to Noah. All the way through the wilderness, David knows from everything he's learned that God only saved eight souls at the flood. And he knows that there was times in the wilderness that he should have just let them all die. But he didn't. That's the loving kindness of God. In verse 7 it says, Do not remember the sins of my youth, my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me. For your goodness sake, O oh Lord. Three times in this one psalm, the Lord is going, the, David's going to use in reference to the Lord, for thy sake, for goodness sake. I've heard, for goodness sake, all of my life. And I've heard people use that in a derogatory way. Would you, for God's sake, grow up? Brethren, we would never, should never use that words, those words, with that tone, with that expression. Because David puts it so eloquently, he says, Lord, for your sake, for your goodness sake, understanding that anything that happens to me is a direct reflection upon you, Father, because I love and trust and serve you, not me, I serve you. And for your sake and for your glory, make sure that I do what's right. Teach me your ways. Allow me to trust in your ways. Always. May I always have a sense of your presence. Father. But here's the secret to that. He mentions these transgressions, these sins. See, as youth we have sins that are kind of, we don't think a whole lot about. The word our sin meaning the sins of my youth is the word that we would think of to miss the mark. To do something without thinking, not thinking about it, not considering the consequences. And I'm saying this to our young people. See, I've got a, a niece and a nephew, about 10 and 11. And that young man can come up and he can say one of the most beautiful prayers you've ever heard in your life, and he's just 11. and has been for the last two or three years. But I have seen that young man, he's never obeyed the gospel, but I've seen that young man 
get upset with his sister and walk over and clobber her. I mean, right back and hit her. But guess what? Well, she don't take it sitting down. She might get it sitting down, but she getting up. And she going to repay the favor. And then you have to get between them because they're big kids. They about this tall. See how, how innocent they are and how not understanding that, that you know, they haven't got the full concept that, that this is not doing unto others the way you want to be treated and doing unto them. You want them to do to you. You don't beat one another up. Well, then we graduate from that as, our, as teenagers. We, we get in 10, 12, 13, 14 years of age. And then we start understanding what, what God does not really want and will not accept. And what He doesn't really care for is what David points out, our transgressions. And that's open rebellion against Him. I know to do better. I just am not going to do better. David says, forgive me of all of those for thy sake. David reminds himself and God that this is both for their sakes. Should we never abuse His grace though? Praising God in verses 8 and following, he says, And upright and good is the Lord, therefore He instructs sinners in the way. He leaves the humble in justice, and He teaches the humble His way. And all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep His covenant and His testimony. In verse 11 then, the second time He says, For your name's sake, O Lord, Pardon my iniquity. And when you get to the 51st Psalm, here are the words iniquity. David has come to a place in his life that he says, Lord, you've known me from whence I was before born, and you know me now, and you know that I will mess up. And you know my heart, though, Father. You know that I trust you. And we know that David had this trusting power for, from, from way back. Because remember that child that was born to Bethsheba that was out of wedlock? Remember what happens when the prophet says, you know, this, this son you'll not raise, you'll not love him because you, he'll never grow, he'll never mature because his life is going to be required. And what does David say? David has so much confidence in God's ability to raise the dead that there's going to be a place for him as well he says, I cannot see him now, but I will see him there. See, David trusted that there was something greater coming, a greater promised land, and he's going to be a part of it. But as we close, let's think about revering God's way. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity. And his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is the most is, is to, for those who fear him, and he will make them known of his covenant. Some of the greatest examples of relationships that we have and we see in the Bible of God is a basically a secret relationship. Because we see, like Enoch, you know, we've often wondered, well, Enoch, he trusted God, he walked with God and was not. Elijah, I mean, there's just so many things that we can see, so many pictures of, of these relationships between man and between God, between God and man, but we don't have the particulars. Brother, we have the same relationship now. We don't have to announce all the particulars of our relationship with God on a day to day basis other than a demonstration of our faith. I trust Him, I serve Him, that He gets the glory. I know He's near. My eyes are continually toward the Lord, for He will pluck my feet out of the net here's what's beautiful to know that in the end as we know the Bible teaches us that we're at war with the devil and he's like a lion seeking those whom he may devour we know that we can be saved from all of that he says then turn to me and be gracious to me for I am lonely and afflicted have you ever felt in your spiritual life where you were lonely and afflicted very quickly, let's read the last verses together then. He says, The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. He says basically, Lord, help me to forgive myself and these sins that I have committed against you. Lord, help me to look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Help me to see, Father, that I need to bring glory to your name. Verse 19, look upon my enemies for they are many and they hate me with violent hatred. 
Lord, again, I've trusted you for the third time. I've trusted you to deliver me. I'll do what I can. And you'll have to do the rest. In verse 20, it says, Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I will wait on you. And then I like what he concludes with. David concludes with this. He's been talking about all of his relationship between him and God. The Father and the Son. And he's talking about all that has been entailed in that. And all the times that he's let the Father down. But at the end of the day, as the king, he's saying, I'm praying for your people. Lord, bless me that we might become a blessing to your children. Lord, help me to help these people to see into whom they ought to trust. Not me, not in my power, not in the blood on my hands, not in my ability to write or to sing, but my ability to trust you. And that's, brethren, what I want us to do today as we leave here. Teach everyone around us in our communities, our neighbors, and our children, and our grandkids, and our great-grandkids, and to whom it is that we trust, not ourselves. But never trusting in ourselves to make it become a law where I think that law keeping is going to get me to heaven. I ain't earned my way to heaven. But on the other end of the spectrum, never abusing the grace of God. Never having a, using it for a license to commit sin or take liberties with His Word and to, to worship any which way I want to. God forbid that that ever be the case is what Paul says, especially in Romans chapter 7 and 8. God forbid we should never do those things. But we've been talking all morning about David. And David never had to obey the gospel. See, that hadn't come along yet. He's trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection yet to come. He's trusting in the Messiah to yet to come. Hadn't came. But now we're on this side of the cross. David was putting his faith and trust in God, and so should we. And the Word of God teaches us that if we want to have a home in heaven, that we need to obey the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Put Christ on in the water of the grave of baptism. Our sins will be washed away. We'll be added to the body of Christ. We'll come up and we'll rise up as new creations and walk in newness of life. And as John says, in my little children, when you sin, just remember this, if you'll continue to walk in the light of the dear Son as He is walking in the light of the Father, then you'll have continual cleansing from your unrighteousness. He says, you have an advocate with the Father. He says, you can go to Him and you can pray and ask God to, to forgive. You can repent. Beautiful word, repent. And you repent of your sins. And God will continue to cleanse you and bless you. That's for those that are Christians. But the last part there is so beautiful in the fact that, that I was a Christian and I've been unfaithful. Do you need your sins and your transgressions, your iniquities, remember no more? Ask God to forgive you as we stand and as we sing. Been nailed to the cross, is thy heart right with God? Dost thou count all things for Jesus but loss? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion o'er self and o'er sin? Is thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within, is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Are all thy powers under Jesus' control? Is thy heart right with God? Does each moment abide in thy soul? 
Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Be seated, please. To help us prepare for partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 764. 764. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. When we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, Hearts are brought in closer union while partaking of the bread. Precious feast, all else surpassing, wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, Do this in my memory. Feast divine, all else surpassing, Precious blood for you and me. While we sup, Christ gently whispers, Do this in my memory. Precious feast, all else surpassing, Wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, Do this in my memory. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Jesus bearing our sins on the cross. And may we take this bread representing Christ's body in a manner worthy of the sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 25 and 26. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blood that Christ shed on the cross for us and as Christians continually covers us. And may we take this fruit of the vine which represents that blood in a manner, again, worthy of the sacrifice Christ made for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible also teaches us that we're to give on the first day of the week with a cheerful heart and not 
grudgingly. So let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all that you've given us. And we pray that we will give back with a cheerful heart and not grudgingly that which is rightfully yours so your work can continue. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our closing song, we use the first verse of number 76, Blessed Be the Tie. Are there any other announcements? If not, let's stand as we sing, then have our closing prayer. <clears throat> Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day and for this time you've given us to worship you. Father, we pray that you would continue to bless this congregation and to bless the leaders here that their decisions will bring glory to your name. Father, we ask you to be with those that are sick and if it be thy will that you will bring them back to their much wanted health. Father, forgive us of our sins. And bless and keep us till the next point in time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>